treat Americans, isn't he? Yeah. Let's give him another hand. I am a retired teacher. I am a veteran, a veteran for peace, and bring you greetings from Central and Southern Ohio Veterans for Peace. I am also the former executive director of the Columbus Public Schools, uh, our teachers union, and uh, I'm proud to say that I led the only strike in the history of the Columbus Public Schools. We had 4,000 teachers on strike for the rights of teachers and children. That was 1975. I know none of you were born yet. Tom was there. Thank you again, Tom. He was out there on the picket line. I also served as Chief of Arbitration Services for the State of Ohio in the administration of Richard Celeste. And I do have to say, for those who say, uh, my vote doesn't matter, politicians don't matter, they do matter. When you get a pretty good governor, it makes a difference. When you get a pretty good president, it makes a difference between that and the terrible kind that we've seen. I shall name no names. We know who they are. I grew up after World War II. Remember looking at maps at that time, you'd look and you'd see occupied Germany. Or you'd buy something and it would say, made in occupied Japan. Our troops had won the war against fascism, but they stayed on to help those countries restore order and rebuild and make sure they didn't return to the dictatorships of the few that caused that great war. Today, American democracy faces new challenges more at home than abroad. A few super wealthy individuals have amassed such fortunes and such power that they can sometimes dictate our foreign and domestic policies. We've ignored the now famous warning of World War II veteran Dwight Eisenhower, who told us to guard against unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. He said, every gun that is made Every warship launched, every rocket fired, in the final sense, is a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. We have also ignored the words of Martin Luther King Jr., who told us during the Vietnam War that the bombs we drop abroad explode at home in poverty and unemployment. The truth, of course, is that while some military spending can provide a measure of security, excessive spending on unnecessary wars causes economic hardship. That's because it's obvious. When you build a bomb, the best thing that can happen to it is what? Nothing. You can't wear it. You can't eat it or spend it. It's not art, and it's unsafe to be around. Critics of President Franklin Roosevelt and the Democratic Party that ended the Great Depression of the 30s say it wasn't FDR's policies, it was the war. Yes, it was war spending that ended the Depression. But it could have ended sooner and better had we been able to spend the money on refrigerators and cars and schools and parks and highways and health care. Growing up as I did in Flint, Michigan, I was also aware of another occupation. That was when the auto workers of 1930s Flint underpaid, overworked, and dirty, dangerous conditions with no health care, no safety rules said, we want a union. 
and we want management to negotiate in good faith with our union. And when management refused to negotiate, the workers occupied the factory and wouldn't come out until they got a contract. That same spirit prevailed in Columbus and around the nation in the 1960s when many veterans who had risked their lives for their country or given up several years of their lives to defend their country returned to civilian life under the great GI Bill to attend colleges and become teachers and other professionals, choosing to work not for profit, but for better schools or better government. They found they didn't have the right to bargain for wages or benefits. And they had little to say in how the schools were run. When they said, we want the same rights as workers in factories and other private sector jobs, they were told, literally, in one Columbus schools, shut up and sit down. Of course, they didn't shut up and sit down. Tom's laughing because he knows. He was there. Teachers, firefighters, police, and other workers used a variety of tactics to get the attention of the government. In Columbus, the teachers decided to hold a 6 a.m. Monday meeting at the fairgrounds in the Rhodes Building. Rush hour traffic was backed up for miles on I-71, and the city held its breath to see if 4,000 teachers would get to school on time. They did get to school on time that day because the school board decided that it would be best to negotiate. Those negotiations produced better wages and benefits for teachers, yes, but alternative schools, libraries in every school, and class size limits. Over the years, Columbus teachers struck only once, and that was before the collective bargaining bill was passed. If the bargaining bill is repealed by SB5, the school boards and the politicians, non-educators, will have the final say in everything affecting schools and our children. Collective bargaining will be returned once again to collective begging. Except, I'm guessing, the teachers of Columbus and Ohio will not go back, regardless of what the voters do. They will not shut up and sit down. And the labor peace of today, which protects the interests of the employers and of the public will give way to the labor wars of tomorrow. When several hundred or several thousand individual teachers show up at a school board meeting and demand to be heard on behalf of themselves and the children they teach and love, my guess is the school boards will wish for the good old days of collective bargaining. The governor and this General Assembly do not have the power to revoke the Bill of Rights. Thank God for that. Yeah. And those rights will be exercised one way or another. That is, after all, the spirit of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Columbus. And everywhere in the world that people are standing up for their rights, as a wise Columbus School Board member, Barbara Levinson, said in 1968, people want a say in the things that affect their lives. In addition to collective bargaining being destroyed, SB 5 would take away substantial veterans' benefits, and not everybody knows about this. These benefits have existed since long before collective bargaining. In gratitude for the service of our military men and women of the past, this legislature, in creating a minimum salary schedule with salary increases for experience, and by the way, they created the steps, not the bargaining process. You hear so much about teachers get an automatic raise. That was created in there. We didn't bargain that, although we support that. 
They established a provision that required school boards to give veterans credit for their service up to five years. It was felt that veterans would generally make good teachers and giving them credit for their service would attract veterans and compensate them for the time they spent serving their country when they might have been in college or teaching. If SB 5 is let stand, it could cost today's returning veterans tens of thousands of dollars over a lifetime of teaching and prohibit public sector unions from bargaining for military reservists and their families to stay on their insurance, for instance, when the service person is temporarily serving or to return to their same position when their service is through. That's wrong. We shouldn't take that benefit away from the men and women who are serving us now, whether you support the wars or not. And we don't. We don't support the Iraq War and Veterans for Peace, but we support the veterans who are serving their nation and are going to come home and need everything we can give them. As a veteran, I ask that the people of Ohio defeat SB 5 and protect the rights of today's returning veterans. And I ask that the people of Ohio reject the return to the shut up and sit down attitude toward teachers and other public employees. Finally, let's be clear about one point. Public employees are not asking for more than employees in the private sector. Because the fact is, when you compare years of education, and remember that teachers, for instance, today have to have a master's degree and all that costs to get one. Public employees are actually pay, paid less than those in the private sector. And they're paid, as you know here, a tiny fraction of those in the 1% of American society who pull the strings on these politicians and try to dictate what kind of society we will have, always so they can maximize their own personal profit. Teachers and other em public employees work for the common good, not personal profit. Let's honor that. As an old tanker of the 6th Armored Division, I'll leave you with the words of former executive director of the National Education Association, Terry Herndon, who said, I look forward to the day when schools get